ignored the fundamental demand of the masses, peace, bread, land. Agitation for land, bread, peace, and a Soviet government is rife in the army. In the Navy, the Bolsheviks are gaining still faster, for sailors are always more quick to revolt than soldiers. The Kronstadt sailors were the shock troops of the Bolshevik Revolution. Dubenko, the Bolshevik sailor, president of the Soviet of the Baltic Fleet. In the country, Lenin's agitators are advising the peasants to form Soviets and seize the estates of the landlords, and they are taking the advice. Released from prison in September at the demand of the workers and soldiers, Trotsky is elected president of the Soviet. Trotsky to the Soviet in early October. The bourgeois press accuses me of signing an order on the Sestrarev factory for 5,000 rifles. Yes, I signed it. And the Soviet will continue to organize and arm the workers' guard. The city is plastered with revolutionary and counter-revolutionary placards heralding the vote for the Constituent Assembly. Lenin, distrustful of parliamentary elections, is demanding an insurrection. Kerensky, afraid to move against the Soviet, assembles the military students and the women's battalion to defend the Winter Palace. Smolny Institute, the new home of the Soviets, bristles with arms and engines of war. Only cadets and the, and the women's battalion came to the aid of Kerensky. Lacking artillery, they barricaded the palace with firewood. All Petrograd knows that Lenin has set the date for an insurrection and that Trotsky is organizing an insurrection. And moreover, they know the date. Petrograd is quiet because it is waiting for the riots to begin. But there were no riots. The government buildings were quietly occupied by disciplined detachments of armed soldiers and sailors. The Winter Palace was captured with little fighting on the night of November 7th, 1917. And the next morning, a message was broadcast to all warring governments, inviting them to discuss terms of peace and the command issued to the army on all fronts, fraternize with the enemy. This is the beginning of the end of the World War. On the same morning, provisions were distributed to the people and a decree was adopted, abolishing without indemnity and forever the landlord's property in the Russian land. Lenin declared that the salaries of all servants of the state must be reduced to the level of a working man's wages. And it was easy to find a prime minister willing to serve on these terms. Also a commissar for foreign affairs. Ensign Krylenko became commander in chief of the army. As business manager of the new government, Lenin recruited his old friend, Bonch Brievich, known up to that time as an authority on the history of religion. On the same terms, a self-educated peasant, M.I. Kalinin, became president of the Workers' Republic. His principal task is to receive petitions from the workers and peasants and symbolize the change which has occurred. The first task of the new government was to negotiate a formal peace with Germany. The Soviet peace delegation, headed by Adolf Yaffe, arrives at Brest-Litovsk. 
Kamenev, Yafe, Karakhan. Carl Radek, and Madame Bitsenko, the first woman diplomat. Trotsky himself, as foreign minister, soon came to Brest-Litovsk to conduct the negotiations. Finding the German terms intolerable and believing Germany on the verge of revolution, he declared the war at an end but walked out, refusing to sign the peace. The only walkout of its kind in history. Immense anti-war demonstrations in Germany followed, as Trotsky had hoped. But the demonstrators were shot down. The Kaiser was still firmly in power. Guided by his generals, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, he renewed the advance against Russia. A majority of Lenin's Central Committee wanted to fight, but Lenin insisted on signing the peace and by sheer force of will, personality, and cold reason, compelled it. His resolution and composure could not be daunted by a little thing like a treaty of peace. But the whole world was against the Soviets. On a pretext of supporting the independence of the Ukraine, the German soldiers marched into Kiev and clear across Russia to Rostov on the Don. An old social revolutionary, Tchaikovsky, forming an anti-Bolshevik government at Archangel, invited Great Britain to help him. Great Britain accepted. Tchaikovsky also, through our ambassador, Francis, invited the Americans. And they accepted. The Japanese invaded Siberia with an army of 70,000 men. The Japanese battleship Hizan in the harbor of Vladivostok. Japan invited President Wilson to join her, and Wilson agreed to send a few thousand troops. The American battleship, South Dakota, in the harbor of Vladivostok. France, Italy, and England also sent a few thousand troops, and Vladivostok became an international war camp. So great was the variety of uniforms, flags, decorations, and complexions that it seemed, but for the bloodshed, almost like a comic opera. At the request of the Allies, 42,000 Czechoslovak war prisoners seized the Trans-Siberian Railroad and held it against the Soviets. In the south, General Denikin was organizing a volunteer army against the Soviets. On the Volga, Chernoff and Avksentiev were raising a people's army against the Soviets. In Kuban, General Bogayevsky was marshaling the Cossacks against the Soviets. A year after the revolution, the Soviet government was surrounded by 14 hostile armies operating on a front 7,000 miles long. They moved their government from Petrograd to Moscow and within the walls of the Kremlin. They shot the Tsar and all his family in the house in Yekaterinburg where they had been imprisoned. The death chamber. The task of creating a revolutionary army was given to Leon Trotsky. 
By persuasion or by force, Trotsky won the services of many czarist officers. This is General Vatsetev. The most famous was General Brusilov. Colonel S.S. Kamenev, famous only for his mustache, became commander-in-chief. In the same month, Lenin was wounded and Yuritsky shot to death by an assassin. Yuritsky's funeral. Zinoviev in the center. 